to uh, talk to us about the revolution going on in, in northern Syria, a place called Rojava. Uh, yes, Paul's been, uh, you know, uh, organizing for what, a uh, few decades? A few. Yeah, and he spends uh, much of his time uh, traveling or around the world, uh, uh, writing on uh, social movements, and uh, your, your blog, uh, Modern Day Slavery. Right, slavery. Right. Modern Day Slavery. So, uh, yes. Paul Simons is going to tell us about uh, what's going on in uh, Rajab right now. Should, should I use the microphone? Oops. Should I use this or not? Your choice. Fine, yeah. fine. fine without it? Yeah. Good. <laughs> I'm happy that way. Um, <coughs> so this story begins in September of uh, 2014. And in September of 2014, the North American anarchist community started hearing some pre interesting Stuff. We heard that there were militias that were not based in armies, that were self-defense militias. They were currently sizing themselves up against a, a group of Daesh fighters in Kobani. And the Kobani, a Kurdish town that appeared to be running on non-state principles, was threatened as a result of this. Um, people who read it got very interested, and uh, myself included. And I finally, in January of 2015, came out with a letter in which I endorsed, I, I said I supported the Rojava revolution. That caused... Um, some discussion on the anews.org website, as well as our anarchism, uh, the subreddit. Um, and it planted a seed, uh, it put a splinter in my mind. And basically what it was, was I was sitting in uh, my office, uh, which was then in Pennsylvania in May of 2015, I said, you know, if I had been alive in August 1936, I would have gone to Spain to see the revolution there. And it looks like there's an anarchist revolution happening on the other side of the world. Um, I have some time, I have some money, I'd like to go see it. So um, after that, I put some feelers out into the community, uh, made some real good contacts in the Kurdish regional government, which we'll talk about in just a minute, and then finally hooked into Alliance of Rojava, which many of you know is a website that brings uh, foreign fighters over to fight with the YPG and the YPJ. Um, so I told them, look, I'm way too old to fight, but I'd like to come over and do some writing about it. So they got back to me and said, that, we think that's a good idea. Um, <coughs> we'll get you across the border, fly to Istanbul. So I flew to Istanbul, and didn't hear from them for about a week, and then they finally said to me, they got back to me and they basically they said, look, we think we can sneak you across the border as a journalist in Iraq, and fly to our bill, which is the capital of the Kurdish regional government, and you know, get yourself a press pass made, and see if you can get across the border going through a, a border crossing called Fesha Bor, which is on the Tigris River. I said, okay, so um, I called up a friend of mine in Berkeley, and I said basically, look, I need a press pass. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I co-edited a magazine called Modern Slavery. It comes out once or twice a year. Between three and 5,000 is our press run. So it's not a huge magazine. But I said, look, do this. Make this press pass out for Modern Slavery. That way, if there's any questions, it's at least kind of you know a legit magazine that can find it on the internet or whatever. So made the press pass, uh, got a taxi ride from um, our bill to face Shabor, which was kind of interesting. It's not often you have to negotiate with taxi drivers to, to go around a Mo an ISIS-held city, but that was kind of what my negotiation for that taxi ride was. Mosul is right between Feshavur and our bill. Um, so I got to the border, um, <coughs> showed the woman my press pass and my, my uh, passport. She looked at the press pass and she said, oh, modern slavery, we've heard of that. <laughs> and I thought to myself, right. The one reader of my magazine on the Eurasian continent happens to be the woman who's going to put me into Rojava. How lucky is that? Right? So she lets me through, and that's where the slides begin. Um, so just to kind of reorient you, and we talk a lot about Rojava, but we don't really see it politically. So Rojava is a long strip of land, northern Syria. Um, there are three cantons, and the cantons are from uh, Murray Bookchin's ideas, which he took about Switzerland, the, the Helvetic Confederation. So the first canton is Jazeera Canton, and its capital is Kamishlo. And next to Kamishlo is kind of an important city of Muda. It's kind of a, a suburb, but it's where a lot of folks and a lot of the cantonal authorities work. Kobani Canton, uh, its capital is Kobani. And then Efren Canton, its capital is Efren. This does not represent military realities on the ground. There is a corridor of ISIS control, excuse me, a corridor of ISIS control that reaches up through Azaz into Turkey. And that's how ISIS or Daesh is getting oil out of, Tur out of uh, Syria so that they can uh, sell it to the Turks. And then the Turks are subsequently selling it to British Petroleum, you know, US and foreign domestic, so. Uh, oh, one, one quick thing. The orange part, that's northern uh, Iraq. That's the uh, Kurdish regional government, which is kind of a wannabe state. 
Um, for all intents and purposes, uh, the Kurdish regional government is a neoliberal colony, exists solely to, for profit extraction by oil elites, and run by a single family called the Barsanis. So, and they've grown quite wealthy. Masoud Barsani, who's the president of the Kurdish regional government, uh, in the summer of last year, made a loan to a Swiss bank to keep it afloat. So they're pretty wealthy. Are you okay with questions in the middle, or? Um, I actually don't think we're gonna have time for questions at all. But if you wanna ask me questions, please stay afterwards. And I don't know if this room is being used again, but maybe we can stay here and talk a little bit. Sure. Apologies, I really wanted to. I'm moving as fast as I can, so you get the New York thing happen. <laughs> all right, Tigers River. <laughs> this is looking towards uh, the Kurdish regional government. Typical border post for this type of the world, relatively developed, restaurants, several buildings, parking lot, the whole deal. Uh, the revolutionary iconography really captured my attention, so I'll draw your attention to a few flags. That's the flag of the Kurdish regional government. It has the traditional uh, Kurdish colors of gold, red, and green. On the other side, before the anarchists hang out, this is a tent and some uh, car tables. A little bit closer. Um, <coughs> The only thing interesting about this slide is you'll see these green figures up behind this tent. Those are Asayish, or uh, because I left the mangled words that I don't understand, Asayish. They're the internal security forces. And as anarchists, they present a real question for us and something that we'll talk about when we get to the, the, to the institutions. Um, from Feshabur, I gave my press pass. Basically, the media uh, authorities had been notified that I was in, in, you know, coming across the border. So they got me immediately to Amuda because they wanted to push me on to Gavani the, the, the next day. So these are some photos from northern Rojava between the border with Iraq and um, Amuda. Um, for those of you, I was raised in northern Colorado in Fort Collins. And this looks a lot like that. Uh, the one exception is, is that this is between the Tigris and the Euphrates River. So this, this land is incredibly fertile. It also has a real high water table, so almost anything you throw in this ground will grow. But that shouldn't surprise anyone, because of course this is the fertile crescent. And for those of the anarchists who are anti civ this is where the problem begins, right? Hierarchical culture, domestication of plants, animals, and human beings, uh, male domination of society, uh, symbolic culture, it all starts here 15,000 years ago. Some Kurdish boys um, <coughs> out looking for trouble. And then trouble is actually that, um, that, that border post up there. That's the Turkish border. The Turkish border, wherever I was in Rojava, I was always within <coughs> no more than three to five kilometers of the Turkish border. So it is ever present. And it is a sealed border. The Turks allow nothing across that border. Occasionally a refugee or two, but that's about it. Um, uh, a village. Rojava lives in her villages. Rojava is three million people, all told. And 2.5 million of those people live in villages. This village, um, from UN numbers, this village averages between 75 and 225 buildings, has between 50 to 100 families, um, and has been doing agricultural, pastoral agriculture for the past few decades or for the past few thousand years. Depends on the age of the village. Um, I should also point out that these villages, particularly in Jazeera Kanta, are mixed Arab and Kurd villages. People who've lived side by side together, uh, married into each other's families, that type of thing. One of the things that we'll hear from this government is we're going to attack Syria, we're going to attack Syria because the Kurds are slaughtering the Arabs, or the Arabs are slaughtering the Kurds. Don't you believe it? That will be one of the lies they will tell. Downtown Kamishlo. So I found the revolutionary iconography, I said, uh, interesting. So uh, from right to left, a flag of Free Rojava, which I think we have hanging here. Um, we have the YPG and the YPJ flags. YPG, Yakin and Parastina Gel. YPJ, Yakin and Parastina Jean. The <coughs> People's Self Defense Forces and the Women's Self Defense Forces. Um, a Tevdem flag, and we'll talk about Tevdem, a very important institution for anarchists. And then finally, an HPC, Heza Parastina Chueri, which is the uh, People's Self Defense Forces, or units which is an interesting uh, group we'll talk about. Um, <coughs> real quickly, Kamishlo is divided against itself. On one side of the street, it's gonna be Free Rojava, on the other side of the street, Syria. The revolutionaries are very consistent. They did not want to participate in any activities whatsoever that indicated that they're a nation state. Therefore, uh, international airports, and there's one in Kamishlo, are based on international treaty. Since the Kurds do not consider themselves a nation state, they refuse to operate. So they told Syria, 
Sure, yeah, you know, you can take the airport, operate it for a while until we figure out what to do with this thing. Uh, Syrian flag above it. You walk in any direction off of that block and you're back in Rojava again. <clears throat> a trap. So <coughs> I went, I spent the night at a Waikiki chat post and then uh, went on to uh, Kobani in the morning. Um, this is a trap. This trap is set to slow people down so that the Assange at the top of the hill can see who's in it. And if it looks like it's a suicide bomber, so that they can shoot at them. So if I'm a dash suicide bomber, I'm going to use dash. Dash is what they're called in, in uh, Rojava. And the reason they call them that is two, two things. One, dash is the acronym in Arabic for ISIS. So saying mm -hmm. ISIS in English is the same as saying dash in Arabic. But dash has another, has another definition. In Gramanji, which is the dialect of Kurdish spoken in Rojava, it means a bully. But the kind of bully only beats up on the smallest scale in the playground. So the Kurds use it, and it pisses Dash off. What they want. <laughs> so um, if I'm a friendly, I'm going to drive up this real slow. If I'm a Dash fighter, I'm going to drive up this real fast, blow myself up at the top of the hill, try to kill the Assyrians, and then maybe try to take over the checkpoint and kill a few more Kurds. Um, a mine. This was a mine on the road to Kobani that went off the night before I traveled on this road. It was a Dash fighter sneaking across from Turkey, planting the explosives, sneaking back. So this picture in and of itself answers the question, is the war won? The answer is yes. Because when you're reduced to doing stuff like this in the middle of the night, you no longer have any military affect in the area. So the war got won, at least in northern Syria. And the good guys won. The approach into Kobani. Um, <coughs> so you, tell, you can tell real quickly in terms of uh, your travels across Rojava, that the one thing that the Kurds, the YPG and the YPJ, the militias, do not want to do again is to fight for Kobani. There was so much blood loss, and the fighting was so bitter that they do not want to have to do that again, ever. As a matter of fact, one of the reasons that ISIS, they won over ISIS, is because ISIS doesn't want to do it either. It was, it was too hellish for both sides. Um, this is right outside Kobani. So this is a, a minefield. That is a, a, a tank trap, a, 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 a you know, tunnel or a, a ditch dug in the ground, and then the berm, the uh, raised earth across it, this goes all the way to the Turkish border, so, which is about four or five kilometers. So it's pretty long and pretty elaborate. And it, again, it's, the whole point of this is to keep um, armored uh, carriers out. It means welcome to Gobani in Kermanji. Rubble fields, there were, uh, these were just beginning. So I was there almost exactly a year after the siege ended, almost exactly a year. And they had just got to the point where they had the resources to be able to start hauling rubble out of the city at that point in time. They've been doing it consistently, and the city looks very different than the photo that I'm about to show you. Um, but it shows kind of how the sealed borders, both from Iraq as well as from Turkey, have really affected the revolution. And they're clear in what they're trying to do is to stop the revolution from growing, from becoming mature. Strangling is cradle. Cars. Um, so one of the things that Dash has done is they have been playing a lot more mines. And the way that they've been doing this is these mines are almost terror devices. So I rode out of the country with two guys from the Mines Advisory Group, which is a British uh, NGO. And what they do is they defuse and take mines apart. And um, they have been working in Habor, which is a Christian section of Rover Rojava. The Christian community is very interesting for us. Uh, formed about 300 years after the death of Christ. They have their own culture, their own written language, their own spoken language, truly a society unto themselves. They also have a tendency in terms of villages to live in villages that are consistently Christian. Okay. Um, so when Desh was pulling out of these Christian areas, what they would do is they would put huge ammonium nitrate and fuel oil bombs underneath these houses. And they would hook triggers to certain things in the household that people would use when they came home. So opening a pair of cabinets would explode a, a mine or pushing a mattress over into a corner would explode a mine. And I asked the guys, I said, so what's the story with these? You know, and they said, well, it's not tactical, it's not about a battle, it's not strategic, it's not about keeping a population out of an area. What this is, it's pure terror. And I said, that's interesting. I said, have you ever seen anything like this before? And they said, only once. It's what the US troops did in Vietnam when they left the village to the Vietnamese. Um, so, this is Kobani, without any editorial comments really needed. This is looking up Mishtunur Hill. That was a hill, if those of you who remember the siege, when we saw the YPG banner flying from the top of this hill, we knew the siege was won. Let's 
Same thing. Uh, an interesting ruin. This is a uh, building that had been hit once by a rather large American munition, and it collapsed, kind of pancaked down, right, one on top of the other. They were saving it. They were going to have a memorial service. They believed that there were two or three families who had been uh, entombed in this building, as well as a number of YPG fighters. <coughs> so they were going to have some type of service before they actually went ahead and tore it down. Kids, um, when I was in Kobani, uh, middle school was in, but grade school was out, so the grade schoolers were all out, like throwing water at each other and playing and things like that. Russian tanks. Russian tanks. These are tanks that were given by uh, the Soviet Union, when it was the Soviet Union, to Assad when he was Assad. And um, then uh, they would have sat in a Syrian army depot for a while, and when Desh overran the depot, they would have been used by Desh. Um, the only thing to call your attention to on these tanks is notice the fact that there's no armored piercing, piercing rounds. And that gives you a feel for the type of militia that the YPG is, because to destroy a tank like this, they had to run, somebody had to run out with a grenade or a bomb, place it in its half-track, explode it. And then once the tank was immobilized, because it only had a single half-track, to get in and to kill the tank crew. That's a real hard way to kill a piece of armor. <coughs> your tax dollars at work. <laughs> An American Hummer. <laughs> um, Iraq War II, given to the, or uh, Gulf War II, you know, uh, given to the Iraqis afterwards, overrun by uh, Daesh in an Iraqi arms depot, and then finally gracefully destroyed by the YPG in the streets of Kobani. Uh, you get the first Rashad story. Rashad was a commander that I met who was uh, a YPG commander for Kobani. And he had a really sharp sense of humor, really funny guy. And we were walking by this, and I said, so what are you going to do about this wreckage? And he said, well, we put it there. We kind of like it. And I said, really? <laughs> and I said, so wh wh why are you keeping it? And he said, well, it's kind of a trophy. You know, it's kind of our front yard. And he says, you have that in America, right? Garden gnomes? And I said, Rashad, this is not really a garden gnome. <laughs> but it would look good with the fountain. <coughs> um, a detail of the fighting from Kobani. This is one of the few buildings that were left standing when I was there. I got a chance to crawl in and around this building a little bit. And it shows the bitterness of the fighting. Look at the Swiss cheese at these walls. And when you go in these buildings, you realize that this fighting was not block to block or even building to building. It was floor to floor. It was room to room. That's as bitter as fighting gets. So, pretty amazing. What were they fighting for? This is the meeting of Shahid Kawasi Commune. And they are a commune that is located um, on the north slope of Mishtanur in Kobani. The gentleman with his finger out is Mr. Shaiko, and Mr. Shaiko is a former pediatrician who currently works for the organization TEBDEM. TEBDEM is an umbrella organization of almost all the political parties, interested individuals and experts who are needed uh, in each one of the cantons to implement, they do one thing, they implement democratic and federalism, the system of, of administration that currently characterizes Rajala, um, and what I had come there to study. So the commune is a basic structure First of all, there's something really wrong with this picture. Any takers on what's wrong with this picture? There are men and women sitting in the same room. That is not a North Syrian normal at all. Okay? When you walk into a home in North Syria, Kurd, Arab, or Christian, there are two living rooms, one for men and one for women. Social space is extremely defined, and that's your first clue that women are a huge piece of the Rojava Revolution. The second one is, and I'm happy to say, he's one of ours, Charles Fourier, the utopian socialist writing in the 1820s said, you can judge, judge the depth and the extremity of a revolution in only one way, by the empowerment of the women who participate in it. And that is very similar to what we're hearing from the Rodavids. Um, as an example, when these communes meet, they have to have 40% representation by women. Otherwise, anything this commune would decide is about You've got to have 40% women. In addition, there are two co-chairs for each one of the communes, each one of the councils, the committees, or whatever. One's a man and one's a woman. The only person who sits in that group that can control the process, by control the process, I mean stop or allow the power to flow, is the female co-chair. She can be seen for any period of time. Two choice. So our friends on the left will say, Rojava is all about gender disparity. To which our anarchists will smile and say, no, it appears to be about the beginning of a matriarchal type of society. That's what they're doing. 
one society versus another. Um, oops, sorry. One, a uh, couple of other things. So this is the basic unit of, of, uh, of the political process in Rojava. Remember in America, we're told it's the individual, right? So once a year we pay our taxes, once every two or four years we vote. That's our interaction with the political system. The interaction with the political system in Rojava is here, face to face. If I have a problem, I go to these folks. They help me solve it, okay? What kind of things do they do? I asked that, I got some great, uh, got some great responses. Childcare, they've helped solve a couple of marriage issues. Um, if they need gas, they'll get gas and get older folks to clinics and you know, hospitals. Um, basically anything that you need, anything that you might have asked a government for or a non-governmental organization. They go to the commune and get it supplied to them. Um, this commune was formed <coughs> during the siege. And um, at that point in time, it was responsible for feeding, clothing, housing, and sheltering everybody in the commune. Now, communes are ideally 50 to 100 families. It's an interesting number. Where did that come from? Remember the villages? Yeah. Ojalan is a brilliant theorist. And what he's doing is he's mixing um, ideas from Kurdish culture hundreds if not thousands of years old with Western concepts developed by including anarchist authors like Butch and Proudhon. So a lot of this stuff is coming together in kind of a new uh, uh, synthesis. Um, I think that's all about the commune. If you're interested, we can talk a little bit about kind of the other cantonal things. Um, I want to move on with this. YPG and YPJ. So um, YPG and YPJ are militias. They are not armies. Armies attack. Armies take territory. Armies control populations. Militias are the people armed. Militias provide self-defense to revolutionary communities. They do not attack. Okay? And that's what the US military is having such problems with with YPG. Like, oh, we should go attack Aleppo. I'm like, why? They didn't invite us. <laughs> it's not what we do, right? We're, we're a militia. So it's, it's the, the disjunct between the two is, is very interesting. The non-state principle, Rojava is not a state, well, we'll talk about whether Rojava is a state in a minute, but the concept of um, authoritarian structure in the army in the militias makes no sense. There are no officers in the YPG or the YPJ, okay? When you need somebody to officer a unit, you elect them, or you can send someone, whatever. And you do it for whatever reason, practical, they may know the area, uh, tactical, they may understand the operation a little bit better than other people, strategic, maybe they get where they're going, you know, further down the road, but they're chosen. And when the battle is over, they sink back into the ranks. They become just militia people again. I hung up with Rashad, the commander of Kobani, and he commands almost 4,000 folks, and um, I never saw anybody jump off of a sofa when he entered the room. I never saw a single salute thrown. And I hung out with the YPG for almost five days. So, very different. Very different. Um, the order of battle, for those of you who are interested in comparing it to our friends, especially in the Spanish Civil War, is um, six to ten fighters is um, a team. Two teams are a suite, and suite is an S-U-I-T-E. Uh, two suites uh, are a garug or a block. Two blocks are a company, and four companies or more is a commando. Okay, so one of the problems, if you remember your Spanish Civil War, that they had was they had foreign Decades, which were ten fighters, and centuries, which were a hundred, which were ten tens or a hundred fighters. It was unwieldy. They either had too many soldiers in the field or not enough. So the YPG has clearly taken their answers, or at least some of their cues from what happened in the Spanish Civil War with the militias. Um, the only difference with the officers is on the Turkish border, which is where this photo is taken. Um, this is a team that is stationed literally behind this yellow building is Turkey, and so they're. Um, They'll elect an officer once a month, and that officer will um, be there and available. Because it's recognized that if the Turks push across the border, there's no way in hell they're going to have time to uh, make some decisions as to who's going to officer the group. The Kurds were spanked by the UN. In Kurdish culture, 13 is the age of accountability, which means in theory you could be married, own, some, own a house, that type of thing. Um, it's becoming less and less the case over time. But they were allowing uh, soldiers as young as 13 to join. UN said, oh, that's child soldiers, that's bad. We can't let you do that. So um, they said, well, they negotiated a little bit and said, well, how about 16? 16 is fine. So this young man who claims to be 16, I don't know. Um, <coughs> he's one tough kid. 
He is from Aleppo. Two of his family members were killed by Daesh. He crossed 175 miles of desert, Daesh desert, to get to Kobani so he could join the YPG. So he looks young, but that's one tough kid. Um, one last thing. So you see the bullet holes in the walls and the dancing soldiers, which I don't know what that is. <laughs> this is right on the Turkish border. And what you do in Kobani on a Saturday night is if nothing's going down, you take a sh few shots of Turkish border guards. And then they'll shoot back at you a couple of times. So it's uh, what, what you do for entertainment. They were told, I asked them, did anybody get hurt? And they're like, no, they weren't aiming at us. We were just shooting at each other. <laughs> Asayish. The closest thing to a state in Rojava are these guys. These guys' sole responsibility is as an internal motorized security force, kind of like a police, um, and their only responsibility is to the Canton authorities. So that's as close as it gets in Rojava as to looking like a nation state. And it's a problem. It's a real problem. But it's something that is interesting for us, and we should, we should uh, at least understand and talk about it a bit. I'll go further. <coughs> there are three ways you can go to prison in Rojava. And there's only three charges that can be brought against you to put you into prison. Murder, rape, and domestic violence. Those three charges buy you, potentially, if you're found guilty, a prison term. Everything else, all other things, you know, whether it's burglary, theft, what have you, car theft, goes to, is, is put into one of two places. Malagel, the house of the people. Malajin, the house of women. And it's there submitted to something called restorative justice. And restorative justice is the concept of prior to a harm occurring, the person who was harmed, where were they at? And if we can get them back to there, and that can be provided by the person who committed the harm, that's what we want to do for restorative justice. So if I steal a candy bar from my friend Bob here, we're both going to be remanded to the Malagel, the House of the People, because we're both men. <laughs> and they're going to say, OK, so here's the deal. You stole a candy bar from Bob. You need to give it back. Or you also you need to work for an hour or two so that you can buy one to give it back to him. That's restorative justice. That's restorative justice. Um, I was asked, I asked him to say, as official, I said, so what's the story with murder and rape and domestic violence? And he gave me an answer, which um, shut me down pretty quick. He said, think of it. How do we restore murder? How do we restore a rape? How do we restore decades of domestic violence, you know, both physical and mental? And I was just like, I don't know. He said, neither do we. So this is our answer. So uh, finally, as an example, Amnesty International did an audit of all the prisons in Rojava in October of 2015. And they found a very interesting thing. They found 290 Daesh fighters in prison because the YPG just does not know what to do with these prisoners of war. They know if they let them go, they're coming back. You know, they don't want to kill them. What they're really doing is they're holding them until the conflict is over so that they can repatriate them to wherever they came. Um, the other 110 are individuals waiting for a court case or, or a certain time. So 110 people out of a population of 3 million is a very interesting number. We'll talk a little bit further about it. Um, a woman is saying, um, Eric, and she's checking the uh, passes of a couple of guys on a motorbike. Um, I'm sure nobody here has ever been arrested. But whenever I get arrested, I always take two pictures of me. One like this, and one like this. So when you get arrested in Rojava, they take a mugshot of you, and it looks like this. Oh. Right? That's a mugshot in Rojava. And the reason that's a mugshot in Rojava is because remember where these people came from. They're revolutionaries. They've seen friends, family members, probably their best friends, go to jail and fall down the stairs or die in Turkish jail or Syrian jails, or Iraqi jails, or Iranian jails. So they don't like the police. They probably hate them as much as I do, right? Maybe more. So when you think about a mugshot, you know, it's a picture of somebody's face with a charge underneath it, right? I mean, it makes it look like they're immediately guilty. They don't like that. So they do this, which is, that's an effectively a worthless mugshot, right? So can you imagine giving this to a detective? Go find this guy. <laughs> Turn around. <laughs> You're worthless. So this is the type of processing that they put into their, ju their uh, judicial system so that they, they're, they're not police. They try not to be police. <coughs> TS Small Commando, this is a group of older fighters. They're tactical reserves. These are the guys who were originally described by Julius Caesar. Sit two or three hundred yards behind the line. If anybody breaks through, they're way too old and way too fat to run. 
So they just sit there and kill the enemy. That's their job. And in Kermanji, the name for a group like this is a meat grinder, meat grinder team, or meat grinder commando. So they're all a lot older, as you can tell. I just want to point out the volleyball net. As soccer is to Brazilians, as hockey is to Canadians, so volleyball is to the Kurds. An insane, fan-driven juggernaut. Unbelievable. I was in our bill, 600 channels on the TV, 50 were volleyball, 24-hour day volleyball. And then I noticed that some of them were classic volleyball, like the Olympic, you know, 1952 championship volleyball game. Well, that got me excited. So. <laughs> this gentleman right here, who's had the rather impressive breakfast, <laughs> said, I want, to take it, I want to show you my flash about it. I said, sure, show it to me. So he said, brought me over to this table, and I took a picture of it. And I said, oh, you've got a bullet welded to the barrel. And he said, that reminds me. Always, if I'm captured, to keep one bullet. So, um, Ken knows this. <laughs> um, it's been six months since I've been to uh, Java, but some of this stuff still gets me right in the heart. So I'm not apologizing, but I want to let you know that sometimes it's hard to get through. <clears throat> June 25th, 2015, 100 Desh fighters disguised as white PG and Asayish snuck across the Turkish border, blew up three cars in downtown Kobani, and then went door to door. And anybody who knocked that door were dragged out and murdered. So this is a cemetery in the north of uh, Kobani where the bodies of the massacre, the, the, the victims of the massacre are buried. My driver had stopped to clean off the, uh, his, the, the graves of two uncles who died in that period. Um, and I kind of went walking from grave to grave looking for something, you know, Latinized script that I could read because everything else was in Arabic. Uh, and I came across this little girl, Hemgen Gary, who was uh, born October 5th, 2014, and was murdered June 25th, 2015. It's a nine-month-old baby. So, in response to this, this militia was brought into being. Heza Parastina Chuari, the People's Health Defense Units. This is an interesting militia as anarchists because it solves one of the biggest problems that historically we have faced. And that is getting our asses kicked where we shouldn't be getting them kicked, which is at home, in the neighborhoods, in the locals. HBC, um, the Ted Dem folks have been talking for a while about self-policing, but really hadn't advanced on it very much. A couple of communes in Kamishlo had come up with the idea, you know what, we need militias, so we're going to form our own militia. Then we're going to approach the legislature, we're going to say, look, we got these militias, we want you to train them, arm them, you know, uh, give them something to do, give them a uniform, but here's the deal. Their control, where they go, what they do, is controlled only by the commune. Not by Ted Dem, not by any of the Canton authorities. These militias are locally controlled and will always be locally controlled. And the legislature said, that's a really good idea. We're going to make it legal and we're going to do this for them. So HBC, the training began in March of 2015. And both Kobani and uh, Jazeera Canton have full complements of HBC, both in the field as well as in the urban areas. Um, so, it was also felt that the massacre in Kobani would have been less blood, you know, less of a bloodbath if these folks had been around and shooting at some of these uh, Dash infiltrators. So Obama is the commander in chief of the military, and effectively, the guy who runs all the police stations and every, every all all the force in the country is driven, driven ultimately by the executive. Uh, the power of the government over its people resides in its war powers. 10 minutes, or are those jazz <laughs> <laughs> um, So uh, the presence of militias that are not responsible for the same authority over the same geographical territory should indica indicate to us that there is, no, is, in fact, no such nation state there. And that's what we see here. And this is, this is actually, this is from almost a year and a half ago. So you would have to multiply these by, militia by several, at least a dozen. There have been a number. And as some of the militias are starting to come apart of the seams, they're joining uh, some of the uh, pro-revolutionary committees. We also see, see here some of the police. So the Asayish are responsible for Canton authorities. The Syriac police are responsible for the Syriac authorities. Uh, Habur guards are responsible for the Syriac as well as Arab Caribbean authorities. So the answer ultimately is Rojava, uh, an anarchist society, has to be answered at this moment as yes, it is. Um, Kurdish culture. Uh, just real quickly, uh, we also get the question, how deep does the revolution run? Uh, and Mohammed 
the guy who translated for me is just over here. That's his dad. That's his brother. Muhammad's his name and the name of the oldest male patriarchal in Kurdish society is taken as some type of clue as to how the generation is going to be living their lives. His name, the name he was given was Ajit, Ajit which is in Kermanji, you cannot find a more revolutionary name. It's the name of the first soldier who fired the first bullet that killed the first Turkish soldier in the war between the PKK and the Turkish state in 1984. It is as revolutionary as any name ever has been in Kermanji. And that's what he was named. Now, this family is not a revolutionary family. Okay, They don't have pictures of Oshawa and, and YPG and YPJ pens. They're not a revolutionary family. And yet, that's the name that they chose for their oldest child. And he had to change it at the age of six or seven because all the little Arab boys in town knew what it meant and kept beating him up. So they had to change his name to Muhammad. This is Malatesta, the only cat at the only hotel in Kobani. And I, I include Malatesta to honor all the anarchist animals that we have all met. You know, Emma Goldcat, Alexander Birdcat. So, Means, long live Rojava. Finally, um, if you're interested, this is my uh, email address, and the dispatches can be seen here. I want to do one more thing for you. I want to play a piece of uh, music that I picked up there, which encourages young Arab men to join the YPG. And I'll put up the uh, words in. Uh, بادر بالانتساب إلى قوات اليبقة الله حي اللي يحمي الشعب قوة اليبقة الله حي اللي يحمي الشعب قوة اليبقة أبطال العزة والكرامة قوة اليبقة كل الفاخر والشهامة قوة اليبقة حي اليبقة حي اليبقة حي اليبقة حي اليبقة الله حي اللي يحمي الشعب قوة اليبقة الله حي اللي يحمي الشعب قوة اليبقة شباب الكرد والعرب والمسيح قوة مع قوة اليبقة نحمي بالقوة شباب الكرد والعرب والمسيح قوة مع قوة اليبقة نحمي بالقوة نحمي أرض الوطن نزرع به الأمل نحمي أرض الوطن نزرع به الأمل الله حي اللي يحمي الشعب قوة اليبقة الله حي اللي يحمي الشعب قوة اليبقة تحية سلام وحب تحية من القلب يبقى يسهر ما ينام يسهر يحمي الشعب تحية سلام وحب تحية من القلب يا باقي يسهر ما ينام يسهر يحمي الشعب يكتب روح الشعب يكتب عمر الشعب يكتب روح الشعب يكتب عمر الشعب الله حي اللي يحمي الشعب قوة اليباقي 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 Finally, I wanted to dedicate uh, this presentation to the folks who tore some white nationalist ass here a couple of weeks ago, <laughs> because that's why I'm here. Because I think that's the beginning of what will eventually become our militias. And I support them 100%. So thanks for coming out. That's a presentation. Looks like we have time for some questions, believe it or not. Please. You know you named my cat's name, Emma Goldcat. <laughs> Emma Goldcat. No kidding. I have had an Emma Goldcat, too. I've never had an Alexander Bird cat, but I'm going to work with that. <laughs> Others, please. Um, how long has the Latin alphabet used, been used in the Curtis language? Um, boy, at least since the turn of the century. At, at a certain point in time, they, but the Arabic languages too. It's Kermanji has been Arabicized so that Arabic is used phonetically in the same way that English has. The actual written uh, Kurdish, you see every once in a while in a rally or whatever, but it's really rare. It's not used at all. Um, Kermanji, alternatively, just made Google Translate, which, you know, like two months after I was in Rojava, it pissed me off. I like, this would have been handy. <laughs> What else?
Uh, why were they? Why were they? Um, why were they beating him up for his name, the revolutionary name? Because Kurdish resistance is considered anathema in, in dom dominant Arabic society. So he was with non-Kurd boys. Who oh, yeah. Yeah. oh, in, in almost every, with, the, with very few exceptions, Arab and Kurd build, Arabs and Kurds live together in villages. And sometimes it's, you know, sometimes there are conflicts and sometimes not. His name caused a conflict because everybody understood that it was, you know, it's like, you know, Carlos the Jackal, what's his name, Ilyich, you know, you know naming a child Ilyich in you know, Boston, Massachusetts in 1927. It's like, what are you doing? Uh, what are some of the latest developments going on over there, like especially you know, kind of in the fight against Daesh in general? Right now, what's happening is that corridor that's in Azaz is being slowly closed. Uh, YPG has always wanted to close that corridor. Um, what's really happening, I mean, two things. One is they're beginning the process of some of the economic development. They're still having problems getting stuff across the borders. They've asked us to do a couple of things. Uh, I got a real request from the revolutionaries. I said, one, Anything you can do to uh, isolate or embarrass the Turkish state helps us down the road to be able to open that open that border. Because right now, Turkey is killing way more revolutionaries than Daesh ever will or could. Because people are not getting medicines that they need, not getting the care that they need, that type of thing. Some foods are being denied. Um, and the second one is they really want people to go out and to work with them. And they're looking for anybody who can build infrastructure, write, artists, what have you. Um, I, I, the, the group that, that does this is the Rojava plan. Um, they're the folks who kind of help me get across. So if people are thinking or are interested in going, please get in contact with the Rojava plan. If you have problems, you can get in contact with me. I'm um, also the slides and the music. If you want, I'm going to give to Kang and to the OC folks. So if you want the slides and the music, they're available to you folks as well. Please. Do you have any insight into the Syrian Democratic Forces? That is, <laughs> yeah, I was there with his form. It's, it, other than the fact that we've got a great flag. Um, Story with Syrian Democratic Forces was initially formed as a result of Hasaka City's, in Hasaka City, it's a highly contested area with dozens of militias around it. They found themselves night after night shooting at each other because they didn't know who was supposed to move where at what time of the night. So SDF was formed, the Syrian Democratic was, was formed, to kind of begin the process of pulling all these folks together. They were also hoping that they could start to strip out people from other militias, particularly FSA. Al Nusra is starting to come apart of the seams, and those fighters, believe it or not, don't want to fight, but you know, they're, they're so they're trying to pull in as many fighters as possible. So. And it started out as just kind of a quick fix for a real specific problem on Hasaka City, but it became very popular. To the, to the, you know, the U.S. State Department mentioned them a couple of times, so they hit the big time. Um, but that federation is only for the militias, and it's only for, to coordinate actual activities. And their responsibilities still reside with the different councils that they come from. The, 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 they're also in the process of forming a federated uh, entity which was announced in Kamishlo three weeks ago, four weeks ago, and then the document that does that comes out in mid-July. So, um, um, please. Uh, what ways can we assist the cause? Um, right now, um, there's now, it looks like they can get some money in. They're in the process of beginning of, um, some organic planting and some collectives doing organic planting. Rojava Plan has a Feed the Revolution website, which allows you to give a few dollars to Rojava. And I actually, I think those guys are right because it's hard to get money or anything closely with some of the PYD representatives and with Suleimana Interact. So, so Feed the Revolution would be a monetary thing. Um, joining the Rojava Solidarity Committee, which Kang is a member of, and helping them with some of their demonstrations and working, you know, within the Kurdish community as well as hopefully other communities as well. I know the Armenian community is very interested in what's happening, very similar. So, others, uh, please. What, you said tur the Turkish border is, uh, is you used the word sealed. Uh, what what's the uh, porousness of, of the other borders? Uh, Iraq, the Iraqi border is catch as catch can. No one has been across there except for maybe a few journalists in the course of the past three weeks because the Kurds are pissed off about the federal system. So um, it really, it, it varies from day to day, even from hour to hour. The crossing with Kobani between Kobani and Saruj, and Saruj is on the Turkish side, and Kobani is on the Rojava side. Sometimes they'll open that up for a day or two, just so refugees can get across, back and forth across the border. And sometimes, well, it's been sealed for three months. So. It's really strange. If they can join all the cantons up, it gives them reach to the one place they want to be, which is Latakia, which is a port on the Mediterranean, which will, which will allow them to re resupply through the Mediterranean. It's also run by what they consider to be a friendly power, which is Russia. So. Uh, 
Um, anyone else? Yeah, anyone I, else? I Please. wanted to ask about the FSA, our relations with the FSA. I mean, the FSA has a lot of different groups within it, I think, right? Some are um, the FSA, when I was there, was a run. It was basically a whole bunch of colonels and majors and things like that looking for soldiers. And so when I hear FSA, I'm immediately thinking, okay, so, you know, it's, I mean, they're, they're so tiny and they're so unimportant, and yet, you know, they, they come at us every once in a while. So, yeah, I, and also, you know, it's like I, they have no, it's not a revolutionary group by any stretch. I mean, at best, they're Democrats, at best. You know, at worst, it's another group of people angling to get all the oil. Let's talk about oil for a minute. Rojava sits on 60% of all the oil in Syria. And to show kind of the consistency with the revolution, they've decided not to pump any of that oil until they can figure out how to, how to get it to the people, how to get the profits to the folks in a way that makes sense. So as opposed to Daesh, which immediately started pumping oil when they took over oil fields, the Kurds allowed them to shut down and have only been operating a handful of oils just for their own consumption because they don't want to do it wrong. They want to go slowly. One last thing, I'll let you go. So what is property like in, in Rojava? Property in Kamishlo is just like property here. You can buy it, sell it, that type of thing. In Kobani, you cannot buy property for love or money. It's all based on use. So everything belongs to everyone. And if I see an apartment that's open, Kang and I are looking for a place to live, we'll go in, we'll use it. Use it for three or four years, when we're done, we move out. Its usage then becomes somebody else's responsibility. The uh, primary group that controls or that, that facilitates this type of thing is the commune. So if we have an issue with our neighbors, we go to the commune. So in Rojava, interestingly enough, like I say, you can't buy property for love or money, but you can use as much as you need. And I like one of the things that they have a provision for too, which is all the, you only get to live in one apartment. So like having six apartments in six different you know, neighborhoods or whatever is not something that occurs. You know, it's not something the revolution is going to smile on. And your comment would probably want to talk to you about. Maybe you should give those other five. So I think that's about it. Thanks for coming out.